Good morning and welcome back. Uh, First Church of God here, Pastor Kevin. And last week uh, in the church service, and I encourage you to go and watch the movie, uh, Charlie Brown Christmas, uh, we showed a clip. And it was the clip where Linus is telling the true meaning of Christmas. And when he says, fear not, he drops his security blanket. That's a very important scene that he drops his security blanket. And when he's done quoting the scripture, he picks it back up. But I also want you to notice something. He drops the blanket a second time. He doesn't really just drop it. He puts it around Charlie Brown's Christmas tree. And when he puts it around Charlie Brown's Christmas tree, the tree perks up. Uh, the, Charlie Brown has chosen the least of any tree. It just has a few branches on it, but it's still his Christmas tree. And everyone is making fun of him for picking the least likely tree. It's drooping. It's hanging low. It's one of those moments where Charlie Brown is saying, good grief. But Charlie Brown has a love for this tree, and Linus steps up, wraps his blanket around it, coming to the rescue. And when he wraps, wraps his blanket around the tree, the tree perks up, and he says, maybe it just needs a little love. Those are powerful words. Maybe it just needs a little love. The tree suddenly stands awake, and it, it is a beautiful reminder that no matter who we are, how many mistakes we've made, a little love can make all the difference. Do you realize that this Sunday is the third Sunday of Advent? Advent means the coming. It's a countdown to the birth of Jesus. But more importantly than that, we need to prepare our hearts and our minds for the second coming of Jesus as well. While he uh, will he find us standing in uh, find us in right standing when he comes again. In some weeks, the four weeks prior to Christmas, this Advent season, uh, seems to be a long time. But if you were at the store in the past three months, you started seeing Christmas decorations. You started seeing thoughts that, oh, Christmas is coming. We better not forget. Uh, it, it, maybe even on Facebook, you say, oh, yeah, it's nine more weeks to Christmas. But here we are just a couple weeks away from Christmas. It, it, it used to be that I, I don't remember seeing decorations for Christmas until after Thanksgiving. Now we start seeing them around, what, the 4th of July? And in some ways, it kind of bugs me that we start seeing Christmas decorations so early at the store. But in other ways, it reminds me that we have to prepare for his coming. Today, at the church, we're going to light the candle of love. And uh, the flame is pointing to the Christ, and, and all of that, the Advent wreath points to Jesus. The, the wreath is the never-ending love of God. Uh, Advent is his coming, and Jesus came as a child, but the manger, the cross, and the tomb, they are all empty. And when he left the tomb, he took the cloth covering, and he folded it up and laid it down. If you go to a nice restaurant where there is cloth napkins, uh, when you're finished, the appropriate thing to do if you really like the meal and you like the service is to fold it up and lay it back down. Don't wad it up. But if you liked it and you fold it up, it says, I'm coming back. So when Jesus folded those uh, burial clothes, it says, I'm coming back. You better be ready. And, and so I hope that this Advent season, you're going to be getting yourself ready, not for the birth of Jesus, but the return of Jesus when he comes to take his children home. So this candle that we uh, light today reminds us of God's love and that his love isn't something that we hoard, but we give it away. I wonder if we truly comprehend, comprehend what love is. When the New Testament of the Bible was written, it was written in the Greek language. And in Greek, there are a number of words that mean love. Now, we're most familiar with about three of those. Eros, which is erotic love. And then there is philo love, which is where the city of Philadelphia gets its name. Uh, it means brotherly love. But Jesus talked a lot and he demonstrated a lot. This one called agape love. And agape love is... Um, unconditional love. It's a love that says, I will do anything for you, even if it means dying for you. It is unconditional. As one friend put it, agape love is love. I love you, period. That's it. There's nothing more. Uh, there's nothing you can do to make God, uh, to make God love you more. Nothing to, for you to do to get God to love you less. He loves you. I was visiting with my great friend, Ken, the other day over the phone, and he was telling me about what he was getting ready to preach this last Sunday. And he was going to be using the same text that I'm looking at today. But there were a couple words that really leaked out at me as I looked at the passage that he was talking about. I invite you to look at uh, Luke chapter 1. 
Get down to verse 26. It says, In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man by a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign in the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come down on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she who was uh, said to be barren in the six, uh, is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible for God. There's a powerful verse. Nothing is impossible for God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me. As you have said, then the angel left her. You know, what leaped out at me when I was reading that passage is verse 28, and it kind of excites me, when the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. And what I, I think we're supposed to understand is God gave generously to us through her, and she was willing to give all of herself to God to be used by him to be a blessing to others. And when you look back at the life of Jesus, he didn't tell us just to love the people who were close to us or who are those people that it was convenient to love. He told us to love everybody always. No one has to do without if we are generous with what we have been given. And I believe God tells us and God demonstrates to us, go big on love. Have you ever been to a restaurant and the service was rather poor? Uh, there are... Uh, then, then there are others where the service is just like out of the park. Uh, I, I believe that tipping is a very important when it comes to our servers in a restaurant. If you've ever worked waiting tables, God bless you. God bless you, especially if you had to work Sundays, because the church can be kind of bad about the way we treat our servers. Think about that. Um, these servers, they don't make minimum wage. They make minimum dollars plus their tips. And if the restaurant isn't doing good and uh, things or people are not coming in, they don't do well. And it can be very tough on them. And during this Christmas season, your tip may be their kid's Christmas present. Isn't that amazing? But I want you to track with me. I want to ask you this question. Uh, do you remain consistent with your level of tipping no matter the service? Do you remain consistent with your tipping no matter the level of service? Think about it. Just because they don't perform to your standard doesn't mean you should lower your standard. Uh, God doesn't change his standard of loving you when you don't love and live according to his standards. So why should you change yours? Maybe they just need a little love. Maybe God has positioned you in that restaurant to change the trajectory of their life by your behavior. Think about how much love God the Father has demonstrated to you. You didn't deserve, you didn't earn one bit of the love of God, but he gave it anyway. And it's not because of who you are, but because of who he is. And he is always consistent, yet he is always unpredictable. One of Jesus' disciples, he'd been a fisherman, and um, he was often found letting his mouth go before his brain. He denied knowing Jesus at one point, but after uh, the resurrection of Jesus, he was transformed into a man who knew Christ and, and shared Christ everywhere he went. He wrote these words in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. He says, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? As I think about those words, the angel said to Mary, you have found favor. 
Do you think that maybe he might find favor in you and me today? Do you think he wants to show his favor to each and every one of us? The angel said, Mary, you may feel like a nobody, but I see you as a somebody. God sees you as a somebody. I don't see you as you see you. I see you as a vessel, and I want to use you to bring my son into the world. I want to love you more than you can imagine. I want to use you in a way that you will re be remembered, and people will be grateful for what you do. Which is amazing, because he is saying the same thing to us. Mary had the opportunity to say no. But instead of no, she doesn't just say yes. She says, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Another thing I believe that we're supposed to see, Mary was highly favored and seen as uh, worthy of carrying the Christ child. Yet even today, he looks at each and every one of us and says, you too are worthy to carry my son. You are going to you're not going to be pregnant with a child, which I'm very thankful for, but out of you, there's an opportunity to show him, to allow others to see him with you. I'm reminded of the story, a little girl gets into the car after church and uh, she's riding along with her mother driving and she says to her mommy, mommy, is it true that Jesus is bigger than anything? The mother says, yes, that is correct. That's what we learned in church. Then the little girl asks another question, mommy, Jesus lives in our hearts, doesn't he? Again, the mother reassured us, uh, reassured her that if an individual asked Jesus to be their forever friend, then they have Christ in them. There was silence for quite a while, and the little girl continues to think. Then she asks this big question, Mommy, if Jesus is bigger than anything and Jesus lives in our heart, shouldn't it show? Shouldn't it show? Maybe what they really need is love. In 1 John 5, 12, we read, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I used to think that I needed to walk in righteousness, live a blameless life. And then I discovered what God really wants is he wants us to live like Jesus and love like Jesus. As I was sitting with God the Father recently <clears throat> about this message, I heard him tell to me, walk in obedience to me and live uh, loving like my son. And when you do that, it brings a byproduct of righteousness. And peace always follows righteousness. God sent his son, Jesus, into a very toxic climate. He took a great risk for our sake. And while we were still sinners and enemies of God, Christ died for us. Into this toxic climate, God sent love where the chances of rejection were super high. What we need to understand is that love takes risks. Love, real love, requires crazy faith to step up, to drop our securities, because many others just need love. And in this season, don't let the little things destroy the joy of Christmas. Don't allow them to turn your eyes away from the love that God has for you and the love that God has for others. And, and, and see that you are highly favored. Understand that he has chosen you before the creation of the earth. God the Father has an ending, deep, abiding love for you, even if you spill the milk, even if you drop the fine china. And if we get our focus right and we see what others really need is love, we won't let the little things bother us. I believe every day is like Christmas because it's a gift. And how we treat the gift is a reflection of the one, of the relationship of the one that gave us the gift. What are you willing to do to focus on Jesus? And who is God allowing in your path that maybe just needs love? Blessings to you this day. Bye-bye.